our lives a lot easier to get to the information that most people want. So, all right, we're going to go ahead and give you a little preview of today, Keith. Hey, welcome everybody. We're up to 250 right when I got on. So thanks for showing up for this great, um, hopefully it's a good concept, but it's a great information from some really great special guests that are going to walk us through some stuff. But so right now we're going to introduce and do a video from one to 110. We're stacking this up pretty tight because we only got an hour. So I'm going to go real quick. And we're going to walk through the fear factor doc that um, Lisa put up in chat that I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit. And then Christine Brown and Tanya Childs are going to talk through some stuff that they have around um, work activity report and other um, subsidy based kind of information. And then we have three Oops, great sorry. guests. Oops, sorry. My bad. Oh, cool. <laughs> we have three great guests from OOD and two from county boards, and we'll let them introduce themselves or I'll introduce them as we move into their slides. Jeannie, Dorinda, and Elizabeth are going to talk through some really important information. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have time for questions. And we're going to do a next step poll that will show us what you're the most afraid of benefits and working wise. And then we're going to have a sequel probably or a couple of sequels, maybe a series um, based on this one to kind of walk us through um, and, and keep us all um, kind of focused in on um, kind of overcoming some of the fears we have of benefits and working. So we'll get to that at the end. Awesome. Thanks, Keith. Sure. Right. Well, here we go. So basically, getting a job is a lot more than just getting a job and everybody, all 257 of us know that. So basically, um, what okay. we're going to do today is just kind of walk through benefits and working and use the time to kind of um, talk about planning and connecting and, and kind of building your resource um, um, resources up so that when you do come across a certain hurdle or terror, you'll have the confidence and the and, and the resources to kind of match that. And I think that's really what this is all about is just trying to figure out, we're all gonna be terrified obviously of this stuff because it's very complicated and it's about, it's very important. So if we all kind of just link together as a state and as a region and as a county and as a um, city around this concept of kind of overcoming the fear of benefits and working will help you guys as case managers and SSAs and the people that you're supporting in their families just to kind of move through it a little easier and more with more confidence. Awesome. Yeah. Keith and I just, uh, we just, we're just really excited about some opportunities for people with, you know, disabilities right now to get jobs. And we just really felt that it, it, you know, the fear is, is at a time right now when there are so many jobs and jobs with good benefits and good, um, good pay rate that we really wanted to kind of start getting more information, even though it seems a little crazy during this crazy time. So thanks for joining us. We're going to do a poll. <clears throat> and um, just let you let us know who you are. I'm going to go ahead and um, oh, uh oh, I shared that out. Well, maybe I won't. Um, oh no, Keith, I shared it, and so it won't relaunch. Pull there we go. Okay, relaunch. All right, everybody, you should be able to tell us who you are today. So on the poll, if you can see it. We got SSAs, other county board staff, family members, self-advocates, providers, OOD, DODD, or we didn't do a good job of saying who you are. And so there's an other category also. Thanks so much. I'm going to try to, ooh, you're doing good. You guys are voting quick. I'm up to almost 90% of people have responded to the poll. So I will share that back out so you know who is um, in the room today. And we're at 90%. So I'm going to go ahead and end of the poll. Thanks so much. Um, share the results just so everybody can see. So you can see that the primary, uh, most people here, about 88% are either an SSA or they are from county boards. That is great. We kind of figured that would happen. And that is the people that we are mostly talking to today. But we do want to alert you that um, these trainings as we move forward are going to be, we want to encourage family members, self-advocates, uh, providers, anybody from OOD, DODD, or whoever that has these fears about losing benefits and, um, you know, working. Anybody that needs can benefit, please spread the word when you see this in the future, because we would welcome people from all different avenues. All right. I'm going to stop sharing that. And we will move to the next slide, which I do have to give a little precursor for this. Um, Keith and I are a little crazy for all of you who, uh, who, 
<laughs> and um, we really were trying to come up with something catchy to get you all to come and listen about uh, Medicaid and work incentives and benefits, because I said I would rather do a lot of things than listen to that. And so we thought something catchy was important. So we decided to go with the idea of the fear factor. So I'm, I, I need to stop sharing that really quick. And instead I'm going to share this quick clip. If you are scared of snakes and worms or fear in general, please turn away. Um, I tried to, we tried to find the most horrendous example of fear factor and I think we did. So we that's did just- a, So yeah. we're gonna give you about one minute just to remember how scary things really could be and let me tell you benefits are not nearly as scary as this so uh let's put a little perspective to what's scary you're just gonna lie in this box is separated in three sections you will reach into the snakes and grab the white snakes and sort them and put them into a bit that's sure. it yeah the end any more for that I hope you guys got a little laugh out of that I'm sorry if anybody has nightmares tonight um <laughs> But you know, we, we felt that we all need a little bit of humor. So, um, all right, I'm gonna go back to this next one. We're gonna keep moving. I do wanna tell you a little bit about this whole idea. Um, as, I, as I stated, Keith and I got together and started really talking about how can we help people understand that yes, it is scary to think about the potential of losing benefits or navigating these systems that are so big, um, but, how do you do that right and, and we and so we were like we have to honor people's fear that's the first thing so we came up with the fear factor but then during some of our creativity we said hey wait a minute there could be an acronym in this someplace right and um and so we kind of just started brainstorming and said hey listen what how do you combat fear you learn the facts right you learn the facts because it's always worse in our head, although maybe not if it was spiders and cockroaches and snakes. That's that that's that the facts are scary there. But for Social Security and for people who understand that, the facts are not that scary. The facts mean tell us a lot. And then once you learn the facts, you need to evaluate which one of those facts will help me, which ones are gonna hurt me, which ones, what really do I need to be scared about? Um, and which ones don't I have to be scared because there's there's facts that support my my uh me not losing benefits. Um once you have the facts and you have that evaluation, you can act on it. You can have action and then get results. And um, I know we're going to hear from Christine Brown and some, you know, about her story, about how scary it was for her to get, you know, a pay raise or some of her friends and, and how has she battled through that and figured out that, no, there's nothing wrong. That's a good thing to get a pay raise, right? Um, having people work more hours, all those things. So, um, Results will happen if you learn the facts and help people through that evaluation and that action phase. Um, all right, so we've got one more poll before we get into our guests. And this is again, what are your biggest fears? Um, I am going to launch it and then I will read them to you. So we've got poll two is, all right, what are your biggest fears? Um, not knowing what is going to happen once people I'm supporting, if you're an SSA or a county board, get a job, like what do they, what do they need to know? Not knowing what to do when or where um, to go when people I'm supporting get a request, a surprise request from social security and or JFS. Um, maybe you're scared about talking about benefits and working with people um, right off the bat. As soon as you, you know, it, just the idea of introducing that talk is scary. And um, maybe it's the time I will have to spend working on, you know, do I have enough time to help somebody through this process? That is a great question. This is a single answer only. And I totally get that you might be scared of all of them, but just go with the first one that you think of that, ugh, that's the worst. Um, so go ahead and put your votes in and we'll share it so that you know that you are not alone because I can guarantee you, you are not alone in your fears about uh, benefits and, and how to help people through those systems and navigate. All right, just going to give you a couple more minutes. We're at 80%. Try to get your, try to put your vote in there so I can keep us moving. We're almost on time still. It's amazing. All that right. is amazing. I was looking at that. I, yeah. I was shocked. <laughs> sort of, so. All right, I'm going to end the poll with 84%. I'm going to share those results out to you. So yeah, Keith, look, we got... Yeah. Uh, a lot of people about not knowing what to do when, when, or where to go when the people, you know, get a request from Social Security. What, oh my gosh, what should I do? Also, just talking about benefits, 
when you are first starting to work with somebody. That is a scary thing. So I love those topics. Um, also, a good amount of people on this call are worried about those other two things of not knowing about how a job will affect that as long, and also um, how much time it's going to take. So awesome. Good Very input good. to know. Yep. All right. I'm going to stop sharing that and we will move on. I think we're going to, Keith's going to introduce this form. And I understand yep. a couple of you have, can't see it. I'm going to re-put it in the uh, chat box and we also will uh, get it out to you via either email or it will be on the Ohio Association of County Boards um, website as far as with the, this presentation too. So go ahead, Keith. Thank you. Speaking of not knowing and where to go or what to do or when to do it, basically what we did is we built a little table for you guys to access that I, I front loaded. We front loaded with some links and information around just lots of aspects of the of the landscape of benefits and working so when you get the doc it's it's you can add rows and columns to it after um the ones that we put in and even erase if, you, if they're not meaningful to you but i we loaded it up with stuff around work incentives substantial gainful activity reporting wages to ssa and with links that you can go to as the initial step if you're pretty if you need to know more about it so this is just a Kind of a beginning conversation, a table, a, a, a doc we can all kind of access as we need to and as you want to as you move into um, being a little bit um, less fearful of all this stuff. So um, that's basically it. And um, I think what we're, today's about is basically beginning a, a, a meaningful conversation with each other and with us and with and the experts to kind of make people um, really feel like they're confident enough to face all this stuff. Like Lisa was saying, um, we're in a pretty scary world with everything else that's coming at us. I think this is something that we can probably manage if we all work together and kind of support each other through this kind of um, bunch of hurdles that will um, we're going to be talking about. And I think that's what's up next is Lisa's going to introduce yeah. um, Christine and um, Tanya, I think. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. And just remember about this form. It is a dynamic. I don't know if you call it dynamic, but it's a form that's great to look at online. Um, you would if you I put it in the chat box a second time, you'll have to download it in order to be able to use it. Um, and and it, it has these links that will take you right to something. So you can kind of, you know, hopefully it will make you it's like the one stop resource for you that will take you right into a link. So for sure. All right. Well, I'm at that point, I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Christine Brown from Nysonger Center. She is, um, she's made my life at OACB all so much easier and so much more challenging all at the same time by bringing me so many great questions, Christine. Um, you, you are a great advocate for um, people across the state of Ohio and actually even nationally sometimes. So thanks for coming. And then also Tanya Childs is with her. She is a benefit anal analyst and a certified work incentive coordinator. And she is owner of uh, Childs Creations. Um, so Christine and Tanya, go ahead and turn your camera on and unmute. And I will turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Lisa. Today, um Lisa and Brian had asked us to kind of talk about one of the work incentives that goes along with your benefits so that it enables you to be able to work. There are more than one incentive besides this that can help when it comes to going back to work, holding on to benefits and things like this. But the one that we decided to talk about is subsidies. Subsidies is a condition that an employer gives to a beneficiary, like they may lessen their hours because of their disability. They may um, have someone who helps them when they do a new task, not necessarily always a job coach, because it could be someone on the job, a supervisor, that helps them with new tasks. They also have um, a time when you do have a job coach that that also can be considered in a subsidy. So, the definition of subsidy is an employer pays more than the value of the work performed, extra help, low productivity, extra breaks, and so on and so forth. A special conditions and subsidies paid by an agency like BBR, DD board, that would be considered like a job coach. The way that we determine that you have a subsidy, there's a form that Social Security sends out that asks the employer to complete so that they can determine whether you are eligible for a subsidy. 
Now, the sad thing about it is, is that anyone who is on SSI is not eligible for a subsidy. The only time that they are eligible for a subsidy is when they're trying to determine whether they are eligible for uh, benefits, which means that say that someone might be a little bit over, over income for being able to uh, qualify for SSI benefits. They would use the subsidy to bring down that income so that they could be eligible, but that would be the only time that they would use a subsidy was is during that period. Lisa, can you change the slide? What Christine and I thought about today was to talk about how a subsidy has kind of helped her to maintain her job, to keep help her to maintain her benefits. So Christine for is my example. She's employed by Ohio State University. She submits paperwork to her employer and asks them, is there any type of subsidy that you give me while I'm working. So what her employer said, okay, you make 1870 per hour. The real value of her work because of the subsidy is $9.35 an hour. This extra support helps her to be able to work extra hours instead of just working three hours, she could work up to 12 hours and still be able to maintain her benefits. Once OSU, fills out this form, and I will tell you, it's SSA 3033, that's what the form is called. It's a subsidy form. Um, so security would typically say, okay, the employer says these are the things that we're doing for her, we're gonna allow her to have a subsidy. So with that, I'm gonna let Christine tell you her story and then come back and kind of back up so you can understand what we're talking about. Go ahead, Christine. Thank you, Tanya. Yes, this has been a very good thing for me because over time, um, as I have had pay raises um, and the university changes the pay scale and things, not just for your performance, um, there's been times of fear of how do I maintain so I don't lose my benefits and this having a subsidy has been life saving because even my family was worried that I would be screwed. And thankfully, no. So it's very beneficial to see about trying to get a subsidy to the amount you can get. And that it's a way to tell your individuals that you serve that this is a way to do it. And not all per, uh, employers do this, but that's something to educate them on it. Now I'll turn it back over to Tanya. And what I will say is when I work with a client and they tell me that, oh, I'm getting ready to go back to work. The first thing that I do is I try to approach the employer who they're working with and asking the questions. Are you going to allow them to have extra breaks? Um, are they going to be allowed to work less hours? Are you going to have somebody who helps supervise them and helps them with new tasks? Do you think that their productivity is a little bit lower than the average person who's working that same job? Those are the things that I go in and ask an employer. And someone who even um, does not necessarily be a benefits person, you still could go in and ask those questions and see if there's some benefits in order to do a subsidy. Um, Christine is one of my very unusual clients because with her working for OSU, OSU has been very kind about filling out paperwork and things like that. The things that I have ran into with other employers is that sometimes they're scared to fill out this particular form. And the reason why is because they think that if an employee was to find out that these conditions were giving to another employee, that they would kind of protest about it. And what I'd go in and tell them is, there is no difference between the work that our beneficiary is doing compared to another employee. The only thing that this does with them, it helps them to stay at work. It helps them to maintain their benefits. It gives them a reason to keep trying to stay on a job. 
because I'm pretty sure that any of you who have worked with some clients who are on benefits, the first thing they say is, "Uh, uh-uh, I can't take a job. They'll take away all my benefits. Well, this is a way to ensure them that no, that's not true. Now, I will tell you that a subsidy can only be done after they have worked, did their trial work period, and they are in extended period of eligibility. Now, I know that doesn't mean a lot, but we're not going to talk about that today. But those are the conditions that you can start getting a subsidy. Um, usually what I do with a client, I try to start working on the subsidy when they start working. Um, only because I think it's very important for this to be in in the background so that when they are able to use it, we can hand it over to Social Security and say, here, we've already got this done. So when you have your beneficiaries come and say, no, we can't work because of this, we're going to take everything, keep the employee subsidy in mind that it could most definitely be a way for them to hold on to their benefits It's a great way for them to be able to get pay raises increase and not lose their benefits. And it's just all around very good incentive that is given out by Social Security. I also want you to know while you are on here that this isn't the only incentive that goes along with Social Security benefits. There are several other ones and and I think at some point in time that we're gonna do a webinar just like this to talk about all of them um, because they are very beneficial too. And there are benefits incentives that also help a person who is on SSI. Unfortunately, the subsidy, like I said, can only be used for someone who's on SSDI. Um, For Christine, she was very lucky in the fact that her employer gave her a 50% subsidy. And so that meant 50% of her income is not going to be looked at. That's what it means when she says she's made $18.70 per hour, but her real value of production is only $9.35. So that's what Social Security would look at. They would say that, oh, we're only going to count 50% of her income every month in order to determine whether she's still eligible for her benefits. So in ending this, I would say that if you are if you come into contact with a beneficiary who is ready to go back to work, let them know that there are ways for them to in, for them to keep their benefits and the subsidy is one way that may be very beneficial to them. And if you have questions about it, there are so many benefits consultants in the city of, here in Columbus and all over Ohio who can help you determine whether a subsidy is one of the things that you could lose, use for one of your beneficiaries. Um, and I'm going to ask Christine to chime back in and kind of tell you, um, like she said, it has helped her to maintain her job because of her pay raises. But what are some of the other ways that uh, subsidy has helped Christine? Well, some of the subsidy that has helped me is um, that I also don't fear of losing my benefits as uh, as a risk, like I said before, for my parents were concerned about the salary increase and they didn't know about the subsidy and now they're, uh, they feel better. And that's something to really, um, consider whenever people are about to even have a chance to get a promotion they always say oh I don't know if I can take this job because I'm going to get screwed in my benefits well if you do a uh, assessment um, even if it's a little before you would be promoted sometimes that's a way so people don't have as big of a hesitation if they were to get a subsidy um, as an idea. So I would say that when you have beneficiaries that come in, this is one way to ease their mind. There's several other ways to ease your mind, but what I will say to anybody who is looking at going to work, the first step is, to get a benefits report, to find someone who is knowledgeable of 
all of the benefits, how they're going to be affected, what's going to happen, that you can give them a timeline so that fear can be diminished. But the first step, again, is to get a benefits report. That way, you can ease everybody's mind because that in that report, everything will be outlined of what can happen when they start to work. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A and I'd be more willing to answer it. Um, other than that, that is the end of our presentation and I think Dorinda is next. Hey, Tanya, thank you. I wanted, this is Keith. I wanted to mention in that doc that's, that people can download from chat, there's a, the first block is about exactly what you're talking about, a benefits report and different ways to access it. So you guys can um, reference that doc if you want to, to find some links around what Tanya's talking about at the benefits report. So I want to mention that real quick. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Tanya and Christine, that's great. And there, I see a lot of people were asking some questions. I love it. Tanya tried to work in a lot of the answers. Um, please feel free to look at the answered questions in your Q&A because there, if you lost the question and you know you can look and see uh, some of us answered them really quickly. Um, so just remember that, yeah, that form that um, they were talking about specifically is the SSA 3033 and that, um, yes, this is specific to SSDI, that with the situation that they were talking about, but we will kind of go through some of these at the end also. So thanks so much for... And Keith is going to introduce our next speaker. Excited to introduce um, Jeannie Hall, who is a work incentives consultant from the Ohio, um, from Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. Take it away, Jeannie. Thank you for being on. Thanks, Keith. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Jeannie. And um, yeah, so I, just a little background, I um, started working for um, Bureau of Vocational Rehab uh, area of OOD in um, late 2013, um, kind of part of the, um, when the employer, Employment First Partnership was really getting going. Um, and our agency hired several of us throughout the state to, to address this exact situation, you know, help um, provide information to individuals about their benefits um, when, as they go to work um, and kind of eat like we were talking about, ease the, the fear um, that can go along with that um, by giving them information specific to their situation. So um, I was just gonna talk about a kind of a couple different things, but mainly I wanted to talk about kind of the important um, factors that are in a good work incentives report. Um, so Tanya just said, that's really like a good first step for any individual getting any type of social security or other um, benefits, Medicaid, Medicare, food assistance, there's a lot, housing assistance, um, is to get a good um, thorough re benefits report um, that goes into your specific situation. So I just had a few um, tips on here of what um, I think is important in those reports and what you could expect to find in one. Um, one is that it's going to provide information specific to that individual, like to, so to your specific situation, not just generic information about all the many, many work incentives and um, rules associated with different benefits. So um, that can just be overwhelming if you're just talking general information to people when it may not even apply to their specific um, benefits that they're receiving. So I try to make sure I'm really only going into information very specific to that person and their situation. Um, so that includes like their specific benefits and includes their work goal. So I'm not gonna um, go into talking to someone about what it's gonna look like for them to work full-time if they're only interested in working part-time. So you just really make it very um, specific to that person. Um, and then um, also important, I think in the, those reports, you'll see, um, you know, breaking down information about a specific topic kind of into two, I always make it into kind of two distinct areas. Like, for example, like, here's some general information about the type of Medicaid you have, you know, the income rules, the resource rules. And then I, um, then I also would have a separate paragraph kind of under that saying, and this is how it's going to specifically apply to you. You know, if you were to work 15 hours a week, um, you would continue to be eligible for that type of Medicaid, or if they're not gonna be eligible for that type of Medicaid, for example, what other types they might be able to access so they can keep their Medicaid. Um, and then third, um, which is kind of, I'm gonna 
go through, kind of show you a couple examples of this one is just um, how I try to present information in the reports and you'll see um, a lot of, um, you know, most benefit um, analysts doing this. They're kind of going to provide information to people in a variety of formats because everyone, you know, learns and processes, takes in information differently. So um, my reports always have definitely, you know, just written out paragraphs, you know, broken down into different areas, that information in just written form. But then I also try to include um, graphs, charts, um, and then I'm also going over it with um, individuals verbally, like kind of explaining it all also. So that way it hopefully covers any, you know, any way that the person's going to best understand and process, you know, that information. So um, I think, can you go to the next slide? So this would be kind of an example. I um, include this in, I think, pretty much all the re all the benefit reports I do right now. And this would be someone who's getting SSI specifically. It's just, it's going to look different depending on the benefits. But this would be someone who's getting SSI and Medicaid um, and a waiver. They have a waiver. So you can kind of see, I try to break down, like, this was someone who wanted to work around the 15, 20 hour a week um, range. So I try to give some very specific examples so they would know exactly what to expect in a certain work situation. So they can just kind of look down that column for that, um, you know, scenario and they can see exactly, you know, how much they would expect to earn for a month, how much SSI that would probably work out to be for them in that situation. And then, um, you know, that they would still be entitled to, um, Medicaid and their Medicaid waiver services at no cost, just like normal. So um, I think that can be very reassuring, you know, to actually see it laid out that way too. Like, um, so can you go to the next one? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, and then this one too, I just, I kind of added this not to maybe within the last year or two. Um, I didn't come up with this myself. I'll say I got the idea from um, a training that I went to, but it it is a really nice visual for, helping people see how the SSI check changes when you're earning money. So the blue is the paycheck, the red is the SSI check. And it just kind of, I think is reassuring when you can actually see, you know, the SSI will decrease um, as you earn more money, but your overall income when you add the two together is always gonna be higher when you're getting SSI and working. So, so just a few examples of um, how I try to like, help people overcome that fear and understand um, the information better. So. Thank you, and, Jeannie. Yeah, I'll answer any questions later too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and now we've got Dorinda Gear from Fairhill County Board of DD. She's a certified work incentive and transitioning youth practitioner. So thank you again, Dorinda, for being on. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate the invite. Um, good afternoon. Um, one of the things that I get asked most when I'm doing a work incentive plan or a benefits analysis, as most people call it, is not, um, it's not asked most, is what is the biggest concern? And the biggest concern is not that I'm going to lose my cash benefits, but I don't want to lose my health insurance. Uh, obviously, healthcare is extremely expensive um, these days, and there's so many things going on uh, that people want to be protected. So the main thing to take away from this today is there are options and chances are um, most people can work, earn significant income and still keep health care. One of those, and this is for people who receive supplemental security insurance, that would be SSI, the means tested program. When their income becomes too high to continue to receive SSI, and that in this year, in 2021, that amount is 1,673 gross per month. When they reach that point and the SSI goes to zero, they often think Medicaid goes away. It does not. They now become eligible for Medicaid 1619B. It's another program. As with everything in the government, there's multiple Medicaids and multiple Medicares. Um, the matter of fact, in the state of Ohio, an individual can earn up to around $37,000 a year and still be eligible for Medicaid 1619B. 
So I'll let you read all that on your own, but do always remember that there's a very good chance that health insurance will continue for those receiving SSI when it stops due to earnings. Next slide. I'm also a Medicare counselor, and when people receive Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI, once they become entitled, two years after that date of entitlement, they then are eligible for Medicare. And just like Medicaid, there are multiple Medicare programs. As long as a person receives their SSDI benefit, they receive Medicare. But what a lot of beneficiaries don't know is if their SSDI benefit stops due to earnings, earnings over substantial gainful activity after their trial work period quits, their Medicare continues for up to 93 months. That's seven years, 7.75 years actually, as long as they remain disabled, they have, the insurance will continue. Um, there's also other types of um, Medicare plans out there as well, which I could get into if someone wanted to ask me those questions one-on-one. -on -one. And the next slide. As I said, people have options. Um, when individuals are working specifically in Ohio with opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities, they can request um, to be put in the Ticket to Work program. A lot of times OOD counselors will automatically do this. If an individual is in the Ticket to Work program, working successfully with the employment network, meeting all their milestones, and their earnings go to a point where either the SSDI stops or the SSI stops, they can be protected from what's called a continuing disability review, a CDR. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that they're not gonna get that review during that time frame, so there's no chance of them being determined no longer medically disabled. So their benefit continues. And there's also other benefits with those programs. It, there, there are safety nets out there. Every, you know, we and the government want people to work and want people to be successful, but they understand that the big cause of not working is fear, right? Fear fear of losing everything right away. And that's just not going to happen. And especially with health insurance, it's not going to help happen as well. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Dorinda. Oh, so, Go ahead, I, Keith. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lisa. Thank you, Dorinda. Uh, sorry for messing up that. I wanted to um, introduce Elizabeth Reisner now from Butler County Board of Developmental Disability. She's at the Employment Net services coordinator there and she also just got her um credential to be a um a um well you can tell us your credential i guess elizabeth if you don't mind yes good afternoon everybody um a workforce incentive planner um so today i'm going to talk to you guys about one of my favorite topics mbiwd um so what is MBIWD? So Medicaid buy-in for workers with disabilities is a Medicaid program that provides healthcare coverage for working Ohioans with disabilities. So historically, people with disabilities were often discouraged from working because their earnings made them ineligible for Medicaid coverage. Medicaid buy-in was then created to enable Ohioans with disabilities to work and keep their insurance coverage. So on June 30th, 2007, House Bill 119 was signed into law creating MBIWD and the enrollment began April 1st, 2008. And I was actually a JFS caseworker at that time and knew you know, how important, what a benefit that was to people based upon the old need standards. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so to qualify for MBIWD, let's look at a little bit of the eligibility, the fun stuff. So you must be age 16 to 64 years old. You must be a US citizen or meet specific um, non-citizenship requirements. Be disabled as per the Social Security Administration. So bottom line, if you get SSDI or SSI, you will be eligible. 
if you don't currently get SSI or SSDI, then Ohio's Division of Disability Determination will check to see if your disability qualifies. Check with your local JFS office as they will require documentation, and this is important, no more than 18 months prior to your application date and be prepared because there are additional verifications that JFS will require, starting with um, the basic medical. This is JFS form 7302. And please don't worry about remembering these form numbers because we will make sure that you have them. Um, it, this basic medical form must be completed by a doctor and that will help them arrive at the full picture of your medical health. And then the next is Social Security Report for Disability Determination. This is SSA Form 7004. The purpose of this form is to provide a record of your earnings history, as well as an estimate of how much you have paid into the system, both now and in the future. And then lastly, the Mental Functional Capacity Assessment, JFS 7308. The purpose of this assessment is to determine if a person is, is either moderate, mild, or not at all impacted in the areas of understanding and memory. Next slide, please. So this is, and I have good news to report at the top of the slide. As of right now during COVID, nobody should be paying or nobody is required to pay an MBIWD premium. Um, but I do get questions on how it's calculated. So I've tried to break it down pretty simplified. Um, did you know that depending on your earned income, you could earn up to, and yes, you're reading the screen right, $105,420 per year and still qualify. So a professor in um, my benefits analysis class knew of a colleague of his that was getting MBIWD. So it's, it's no joke. Um, and then secondly here, if your income is over 150% of the federal poverty level, and for the year 2021, that is $1,610, you will have a premium. And it is figured by taking your gross income subtracted by the 150% of the poverty level number. And then when they get that outcome, you're going to multiply it times 10%, and that will give you your monthly premium. The premium you pay will depend upon your income, as well as your medical expenses and impairment-related work expenses. Next slide, please. So um, I gave an example here using the DB101 premium estimator. Now, I'm going to say a disclaimer to this. JFS has the final say as to what your premium is going to be. This is merely used as a tool to kind of give you some guidance on what it might be. So here's the website and we'll, we'll type this into the chat, but it's ohio.db101.org slash planning. And it's gonna ask you for your gross income. So just for this example's sake, I put in that I earn $200 gross per month. Then it's going to ask you about your impairment related work expenses. And these are defined as any out of pocket cost for items or services that you need in order to work because of your disability. So I gave an example here. Let's say I pay $50 a month for um, transportation cost and out of pocket medical expenses I put as zero. But if you had like, let's say you're paying on a large hospital bill and you're making installment payments, then you could potentially count that. Then when I calculated all that, my final premium was only $25.50 a month, which is a whole lot cheaper than paying for out of pocket, you know, through the employer um, or through the state exchange. So how do I apply? Um, so you're going to contact your local JFS office. And if you don't know who that is or where that is, we've given a link here. Um, the form number is 7200. It's the same as for the food stamp and cash assistance, but you'll typically want to indicate on there that you want to have MBIWD explored. And then you can also apply online at benefits.ohio.gov. 
And lastly, I will give a shout out to the resource limit because I know a, a lot of people ask that. So it is $12,555. You cannot exceed that with the resource limit. So that's all I have. And I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Back to Keith. I wanted to thank um, you, Elizabeth, Christine, Tanya, Jeannie, and Dorinda for great. Um, you did a beautiful job. You got through it really well. So thank you. I'm going to give, throw it over to you, Lisa. Wow, you guys. So I know that was a ton of information and we are, we know that. <laughs> um, I do want to do this poll really quick. And then I do want you to hang on and stay with us because I'm going to go through some of the questions that we answered um, and, and any outgoing, you know, any more questions that are coming up, we'll, we'll have about, um, you know, five or 10 minutes to answer those questions. So let's launch this poll really quick. Again, we want to do this again. We know that there are more questions about what we just talked about, and there are more questions about things we didn't even start to talk about. So we're going to give you um, this poll to kind of just show us what things are interesting to the group that are on the call right now. Um, again, uh, what would you like more support and training on? And you can select as many as you want on this one. So um, SSI and SSDI, Medicaid, Benefits Analysis and Education, Ticket to Work Act, Disability Benefits 101, and um, Income and Benefits that are outside of SSI and SSDI. So again, I know that these are um, probably you're going to, I can tell because I get to see what everybody's saying, Keith, ahead of time. And they're just going to tell us they want everything. I, want, I, wanted, to, I wanted to mention too that the next iteration, the next in the series, um, Deb, Deborah Wagner, who's with the Legal Aid Society of Greater Cincinnati, is going to help us be the expert to kind of pull that one together. So this is going to be, it will respond to your, um, you know, top fears in the next one as well. So Absolutely. All right. Well, I don't know how much they're going to really give us because we've given so many things that, that it sounds like they lots of interest in lots of things, but I'm going to go ahead and end that poll so that we can get to some questions and I'll, uh, I'm going to actually keep, we're going to keep these results top secret because we have to figure out exactly um, what we're going to give you, but I can guarantee you that there is nothing that people don't want to know about Keith. So I think That's we're and, and I think we, we this hour is so energizing and so terrifying that we probably the next one will be, be an hour and a half possibly. Yeah. But, yeah, the, absolutely. but we wanted to we wanted to get up with a bang with this one and kind of keep your interest into the the mix as we move into a, a series possibly. Absolutely. So if all the panelists could um, turn on their cameras for me and um, potentially unmute if you feel like you can, unless you got dogs barking. Um, and let's let's go through a couple of these questions that we've been talking about and, um, and, and see, we've got some open questions. Um, I know specifically, and this is, let's go with this one, Tanya, that I think it says you might be typing, but how do you request a subsidy, the simple form? I know there's a form associated with it. Can you tell us about that? The form, you can type in SSA, 3033 and the form will pop up from social security and um, it's a fill-in form that you get but what i would truly suggest is that you get a hold of a benefit specialist um CWIC, or someone who actually knows how to complete the form because what happens a lot of times um, when someone starts a job social security will send out a work activity report, they will send out the subsidy form to an employer. And the employer looks at it and says, I don't know what this means and just kind of throws it in the trash can. We find that happens all the time. So my suggestion is to find a benefit specialist, analyst, someone who is familiar with benefits and have them to talk to you through how to get this form filled out or even talk to the employer and tell them the best way to have this form filled out. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, okay, so it, a lot of people keep asking about the copy of the PowerPoint. I'm sorry. We will get it out to you and you all have my email. Um, if you don't get it, let me know. The dilemma is that I, I did not save it in a PDF form and I, I want it to be in a PDF form when I put it. Um, hey, you know what? I, I did save it in a PDF form. Do you want me to go ahead and upload it yeah, now? Yeah, why don't you upload it okay. here? And then we still will be posting it on um, the uh, OACB uh, Member Connect, as well as I will do my best to grab the email list off the attendees and send it out to you on that too. So I'm going to go ahead. 
Um, Elizabeth, there's a question in there about will everyone on um, Medicaid buy in have a premium? Do you know that? Yeah, only if they are over the 150% of the poverty level. Um, so that $1,610, if their gross earnings is over that, then yes. Great. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, I wanted to go back. Uh, so I answered that one. I don't know why. Sometimes I can just get rid of things and sometimes I can't. All right. So we're going to go to a couple of the questions because we have about five minutes that were um, answered so efficiently by our panelists. Oh my goodness, you guys. To are totally right. efficient. I, I mean, I'm, I'm in <laughs> shock at how great you guys did this. Yeah. So anyway, I'll be but I want to make sure everybody hears it. And if there's anybody else on the panel that would like to jump in, sometimes you might get a different perspective. So um, we have a question that says, I have an individual that receives SSI who is worried about getting a job. It took over 40 years to get that SSI. And she's very afraid that if she does take a job and loses the benefits that if for some reason she can no longer work what happens like if you work for a while and then you lose your job um will it be hard to get those ssi benefits back so tanya did answer um but i would love it if tanya's answer was for every two dollars she earns only a dollar will be taken away from her benefits she will still be eligible for medicaid i'd love it if any of the other panelists would like to jump in about the best way to um address you know for corey those those issues about fear of what if I lose my job and then I can't get my benefits back? So this is Dorenda. I thought I'd answer as well. Um, if a person loses SSI due to earnings, they have 12 months from the month they lost the SSI that if their earnings go below that break even point or to nothing because of disability related reasons, they can go back to Social Security and request an expedited reinstatement of their benefits without having to reapply. Mm. Great. Yeah, I love all those security nets and then also being able to maybe go back there for that if you do for some reason get to that point. So awesome. Great. Um, I think we have a couple new questions also. So I want to go there. Um, let's see. Uh, can OOD assist? or job coach assist an employer in filling out the subsidy form for a person. Well, geez, John, I am telling you that this, this, this is what started this whole training is who fills out that form and assists people. Um, I know that Tanya gave some, some good information around that. Tanya, you want to reiterate what you had mentioned about who I was, might assist? I, I would say find a benefit specialist I mean, and we have all different kinds of names. Some of us are co by practitioners, some go by benefit specialists. I go by analysts, but find someone who's been trained in benefits and ask them how to go about getting your subsidy. And like I said, there's a subsidy is just one of many work incentives that there is that can be applied to someone who's working. But I always say find a benefit specialist who can help you to understand what you need to do. Yes. Jeannie, did you want to talk to that question around OOD? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think with that specific form, I mean, uh, I don't know if you're asking like OOD, like as the benefits, as a benefits person with OOD, I wouldn't, um, I definitely would help, like Tanya said, know like how, like how to answer and like give some tips about that. But it really needs to be completed by someone who is seeing that person at work doing the work. So um, I know that what I've heard, um, you know, is sometimes employers, like Tanya said, are reluctant to fill out that form because they're afraid it's somehow like they're being negative, you know, or it's going to negatively impact that person, which is not the case. But, you know, there's some, you know, some hesitation there. So sometimes a job coach is a great person that can, because they're, you know, might be there with the person. They can actually talk about how they're assisting them or, um, you know, someone else that, um, yeah, that is seeing them in the work setting that can give real information. I think that's one of the main reasons we did this, um, Lisa, is that we wanted people to be aware that this might happen. And then you have to plan on who would do it. And it might be the job mm -hmm. coach. It might be a family member. It might be mm -hmm. um, a co you know, whoever is in that person's life that can be that, that connection is going to be the what you need to have in, in the mix as you move forward. So I think that's kind of one of the main reasons we wanted to kind of get together and do this is 
is that idea of always kind of knowing that this might be in the offing and that you're working as a team to kind of figure out who's going to do what as you move into it. Mm -hmm. Christine, Christine, do you want to share? Because I know that was that was one of the reasons why you and I teamed up to do this training was about finding somebody to help with that. Um, anything you want to add to that before we close out the meeting? It's two o'clock. Well, I can just tell you that I really think that in part of the employment first um, process, as we move forward into the path and people going for jobs and um, trying to know about the differences of risks and benefits, there needs to be a process that I think team members have to know um, Who to go to. what to do in the process because that is so no one will feel like there's a fear of losing the benefit um, because we want to see more people working and because this has been a tough time during the pandemic, we don't want people to have a fear that they they go back to work, they're going to lose their social security. Right. No. So right. that is a big point to really, uh, I think, take away from this is no, they go back to work. There's ways around to keep your social security. So don't have the red tape stop you. That's right. And I, I, I want to share with Christine, um, she has been helping um, some other people advocate um, to find people that can help uh, with that um, subsidy. And she's been through the ringer. And I really want to give her some kudos because she's really tried to advocate for people, whether that's finding somebody like Tanya, who is a benefits analysis, understands it to, to assist people, um, whether it's somebody, you know, I really think that it's, it's a systems issue that we all need to address. Mm -hmm. So if you work for a county board agency, it's important mm -hmm. that in your county, you figure out who in your county understands about that subsidy that could be a resource to people um, to either mm -hmm. educate your SSAs, educate families, educate mm -hmm. um, self-advocates um, mm -hmm. about how to ask an employer to complete that form. And one more mm -hmm. shout out to the form, to that table that I we uploaded, you guys have access to. That first row is about this very topic about who and where are these specialists and these CWICs? And they come from all different areas of the of state agencies. They're in county boards sometimes, they're through OOD sometimes, and then also through um, Disability Rights Ohio and Legal Aid in different parts. And there are links in that row for you to, to discover where these specialists um, are located and, and how to access them. So that's something I wanted to make sure there's a big takeaway about. And Keith, you also let us know that some of us are, there are some that are in private businesses like mine. There's, there's some that works for agencies. And then there's some of us out here that have businesses that actually do that for folks that, you know, may Thank not you. be yeah. in an OOD or one of the other agencies. Shout out to you, Tanya. Sorry about that. I, I didn't want to exclude you at all. Yeah, for sure. All right. Okay. Well, everybody, it's 2.03. We want to be respectful of your time. We really, we know that there's lots of questions. This was just the beginning of starting to collect some, some facts. Um, and, and if all you got was a little bit of like, I need to find out more about this, that then we've set up, we've done what we need to do. Because again, going to that um, tool that we are, that we've shared in the chat box, along with um, checking it out when I email it out to you, that's going to take you to some more specific links. And of course, mm -hmm. Keith and I, and most of our, um, uh, panel has shared their contact information too. So um, please look out for another announcement about another meeting. Um, we probably are going to get together and uh, come up with a, the schedule coming out for the next three or four and get all those going for you guys. So appreciate everybody um, for coming today and have a great Monday. And remember, don't be too scared, right? This has got to be better.